today, again, thanks for taking the time. We're going to go pen testing. What pen testing is, is really going through the process of finding vulnerabilities, right? So um, what we're going to go through is a small snippet because of our time constraint of pen testing itself, CompTIA pen test plus and or EC Council's certified ethical hacker takes a tremendous volume of time. You're not going to learn everything literally in one session. So it is like Mr. Edwards has mentioned before, it is a boot camp. It takes a significant chunk of it. So um, the field right now, especially given the economic environment, is very keen on having a lot of pen testers in place. Uh, what happens when the, the economy takes a downturn? There's a high rate of crime. Unfortunately, that is, that's what happens. Uh, so vulnerabilities come out, uh, ransomware. Uh, at the end of the day, we need pen testers. And at my current organization, we need a lot of pen testers. So, uh, so there's jobs in the queue for anybody who wants to be a pen tester, security analyst, or a SOC analyst. So with that being said, pen testing is extremely popular. I Popular in a positive and negative way, right? Um, companies do need to have pen testers in place in order to make sure that they have their processes uh, stout. So introduction to pen testing. So pen testing in itself is what we hear. So pen testing is called penetration testing. Basically what you're trying to do, <laughs> I laugh because you gotta love the graphics. Uh, what you're trying to do as a pen tester is find vulnerabilities in any organization. So uh, they will hire pen testers. Uh, my time with HackerOne, which is a bug bounty platform, uh, gave uh, me opportunity to learn more about pen testing, but also uh, about the processes we, we worked with in terms of customer uh, engagements. Um, so again, vulnerability testing, finding the vulnerabilities, giving the, the company the report and helping them remediate these vulnerabilities. Because if you have vulnerabilities in place, that means that's its favorite targets for hackers, right? So as you're a pen tester, on the flip side of that, you're also a certified ethical hacker. What's the difference between a certified ethical hacker and a hacker? Nothing except for permissions. You're permitted to do what you do for an organization. You're permitted to hack into an organization. As we described before, what is pen testing? Simulated attack that's done with proper authorization on information systems and applications. That's the key word, proper authorization. If you do not have authorization to do so, that means that you're on the other side of the coin. So uh, what we do here in our industry uh, is ethical. So meaning that everything we, for rules of engagement, ROE, uh, we have to have permission before we do anything. So when you engage with an organization, they'll make you do all these sign-offs and such because at the end of the day, they're literally giving you three type scenarios. They give you a white box, a black box, or a gray box. A white box pen test means that they give you full flexibility or insight, transparency, basically, in your operating in their operating environment. So you know what system applications they use, what systems, probably pro possibly some APIs uh, background as well too, their integrations. So you will really have a clear picture of what you're you're starting. You're planning your attack methodology. Uh, a black box testing, you go in blind. So when I say that, uh, that engagement, the operating environment, the OE for that one is completely foreign to you. You have no way of finding what it is. So that's, that's you're acting typically in that scenario as a true, true hacker. Um, when you have gray box testing, uh, pen testing, you have a little bit of what we call the half and half. You have some transparency and some not. The reason why they tell you why white box and gray box exists is the fact that there are systems in place that is very, very sensitive. So customer data, payment information, if you uh, are hacking into a, uh, or doing a pen test for a, a hospital, there's a lot of uh, personal mode identifier identification, HIPAA information. So in that process, they want you to not touch those particular cycles or, or applications, right? The reason why is that it could cause a breach. Breach causes information leak. Information leak causes people 
to lose their information that puts it into what we call the dark web, right? Everybody's heard of it, maybe have dabbled in it as well too. And then in some cases, those are used as a, um, a mechanism to uh, co co convince somebody to pay ransom as well too. So those are the three types of operating environments that we have. So there's different teams. You have a blue team and you have a red team. Blue team defends, basically at the end of the day, the offensive team. Red team attacks. So if you're a red team, you are the adversaries. Basically, you're the bad guys. Um, so you go in, whatever your operating environment is at the end of the day, and you find vulnerabilities. Uh, H1, Hacker One uh, did uh, hack the Army, hack the Air Force. Uh, that was a blind environment. Red team came, the, 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 they invited hackers into the, the fold and they found 600 votes. 48 vulnerabilities within a day. That's a lot. Uh, all the veterans in here, you know about top secret clearance or top secret with the SEI capability. You know that's that's a lot of vulnerability for something that's extremely high classified information. So red team members are very, very looked upon. They're, they're pretty elite. I, I will have to tell you that. They get paid pretty well too. Um, so as it calls out in the slide itself, red teams are frequently made up of independent ethical hackers. So similar to what I discussed with pen testing, uh, bug bounty platforms, crowdsources, a, uh, a myriad, millions, uh, literally, of hackers. And they have signed contracts with bug bounty platforms. And their sole job, if they're extremely good, is to find vulnerabilities and with the Hack the Army, Hack the Air Force events, uh, a team of 30 all over the world, literally, was flown in to a specified location, which I cannot uh, notate, um, to do the vulnerability assessment. And they found that many in a day. So again, uh, <clears throat> prestigious role takes a little bit of time, but the gateway into this is having your certification. I will tell you that no, you can be extremely good and you can do this as a freelance, but at the end of the day, if you don't have certification, you're not gonna get paid to do a, be a red team member. Cybersecurity uh, goes. Certification? I'm sorry, go ahead. Which certification are you talking about here? Is this for pen test or for security plus? That, uh, oh, no, no, no. So for this one is specifically, thank you Frank for that question. Frank's question is, what is the, the specific certification for this? It's part of the curriculum. It is called uh, CompTIA's pen test or pen penetration testing plus and or EC Council certified ethical hacking. So good question. Thank you, Frank, for that. Can um, I ask a follow-up question on that? Yeah, Is this please. type of certification that you can take without a lot of um, IT background or is it something where you already have to have a certain level of skill before you take that certification? Oh, fantastic question, Candice, on that. So um, the question was, do you have to have an IT background? No, I will tell you that. So I, uh, it's nice to know, really, to be honest with you, some familiarity within the, the IT space. Uh, I took it because I had, I was not a cybersecurity professional at that point in time. I was to procure purely a procurement professional in the technology company. So I learned the terminology and I worked with my internal stakeholders to learn more, right? But at the end of the day, you don't have to have an IT background. This is why this program and the program I went through uh, takes you from ground zero all the way to certified. So I'm not selling the any particular program or anything of that nature. What I'm telling you is the truth. I had no inkling of what a pen test was is until I, until I started the, the boot camp and then afterwards I was able to sit it for my exam and knocked it out. So uh, really good question. No background needed. That's what my job is for to get you to that point. Uh, fantastic question though. Um, red team's goal, find vulnerabilities. What the ultimate goal for a pen testing company or service is to find those vulnerabilities to let the company know so they can remediate against it, meaning that they have to build up procedures. If it's a weak API point, if it's weak applications, weak access control points, whatever it may be, they have to build to enhance it, whatever they, or even get rid of it. Some things, we have some things that list, uh, live in uh, like legacy programs that are favorite targets of mine as well too. 
So the hacker's mind. Uh, that's exactly how it is, right? Uh, on the slide it says, sometimes you have to act like the bad guy. And you do. Pen testing is exactly like that. You have to find the keys to the kingdom. Like Frank said at the beginning, you have to find a way to get in. And that's, that's the way it is. Um, and I say that very bluntly because <clears throat> there is no rules of engagement or what's off limits when you, when you interact with a, or when a, a threat actor or a hacker is targeting your company, your system. There's none, you know, nothing's, everything's uh, at fair play at that point in time. So you have to think that way in order to uh, build a valuable business case for your customer uh, and your company. <clears throat> Reasons, at the end of the day, you're protecting a lot of data. Any company, regardless of what it is, has intellectual property that is very crucial to their business. Technologies companies have you know, source code that's associated with their product, right? Um, uh, I work in a different industry that does a lot of PCI payment type of, uh, though technology related, we do a lot of PCI DSS uh, compliancy, which is payment structures. So a lot of routing numbers, financial institutions, uh, a lot of highly sensitive information has flown through. And if, I, if anybody's looking for a target, that's it. You know, how's, what's the best way to seize a data set, use it as ransom, and get it paid, right? Stealing customers' information or patients' information. Any, like, that's why you're safeguarding your social security numbers extremely uh, diligently. You know, 10, 20 years ago, let's just say that social security number theft or uh, that type of uh, fraud was there, but it's not as prevalent nowadays. It's everywhere. And it, it's commonplace, unfortunately. So pen testing itself, who performs it? Red team, two pen testers, internal and external. Your ex, usually, if you're a publicly traded company, you're doing external pen testing. If you're intern and you'd run a internal pen test, what we call tabletop exercises, maybe quarterly. When you run an internal pest, uh, penetration test team, what you're looking for is a cost comparative, right? So if you're using externals, you're gonna be paying more. Uh, some bug bounty programs will pay our yearly cost, you'll have to pay $150,000 as a platform cost in addition to bounties. So bounties are targets, right? If you find a vulnerability that rates on a seven scale or eight scale or whatever it may be, those are higher targets. So meeting higher targets, meeting higher price tag. If you find an 8.0 vulnerability, you're getting paid $5,000 extra on top of that, right? For not you personally, but the company. So they have, you have to pay the hacker that much. Um, so it, it is a cost uh, effective solution if you have your internal test team. Um, our penetration test team is internal here at the organization I work at, but because we are publicly traded and we have literally $160 billion worth of sales, we have to have an external pen test team. So we engage with external pen test teams, platforms, bug bounty platforms, and we do our internal tabletop exercises for tests. You have to have to have that. Um, sorry, Frank, I didn't, I didn't mean to skip over your question. Go ahead, sir. You didn't, I had just raised my hand, so you're good. All right. No, okay, so there's two kinds, like the way you're explaining it, if I get this correct, just to, for my own clarification and for anybody who has the same question. So there's two, bas two basically kind of pen testing. You said the internal work for the company Yes, sir. Usually work for the company themselves, but they also get external. The external would be an external, another pen testing company, right? Yes, sir. So you like internals, and then you get your externals that you bring in for extra added, added layer. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Frank, well okay. said on that. So I just want to double check. No, 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 absolutely. No, well said. So what Frank said was there's two teams. Uh, so we have the external and internal. External is you're publicly facing. You have to have the external team. But also external means that they have uh, capabilities that literally sometimes your internal teams may not have, right? Uh, internal teams, you do that on a quarterly basis, every once every three months or whatnot, uh, if you can afford it or I mean, your company can afford it or biannually. Uh, that keeps you sharp. 
right? But also those people are intimately knowledgeable about your operating environment, meaning that there's no surprises for them. So that's really a white box pen test, right? Externals go in and you define the rules of engagement, white box, black box, gray box, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's going to be black box, right? But sometimes if you're very, like my company, we do gray box. Where there's something they, they cannot touch because we have a pharmacy component. So very well said on that. Hey, Johnny, t- tell the group, if, if, if you can, what are the types of things that people do during a pen test? What are, what are the skills that, that, that you need to have? Um, yes, sir. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yes, sir, Mr. Edwards on that. So skill sets, uh, knowing the different type of tools that we have. So in class, we, and in, in real, to be honest with you, when you really go into your, your space, tools like Kali Linux, Temple, those types of tools, to name just a few, are tools that you will be in essence as well to, you're doing port scans, you're finding vulnerabilities, you're, you're trying to intercept messages, um, you're going through backdoor scenarios. When I say backdoor scenarios, it's like, for me, targets that I look for as a CEH is legacy systems, systems that are siloed, but people have access control to it. Legacy systems have a lot of, uh, uh, give access to individuals that are literally a little bit higher up on the hierarchical, you know, uh, organizational leadership chain. And what happens, controllers, uh, financial people, right? They have access to it. And if you get their uh, credentials, you use that to escalate yourself into other systems. And then, then you can go into other, other systems. That's how you go through the process uh, to get into the system and manipulate things. Uh, that's one way. APIs uh, is another way as well too. We, in class, uh, we don't go through an in-depth API review, but we do. Uh, you have a, uh, a touch point one within Python in our curriculum as well too. Uh, it's really familiarization and learning to read, and be able to decipher uh, in that aspect. So I will tell you if you, uh, some of you are in the field already, uh, some of you are not uh, as of yet, uh, Python is the language that you should be looking at, uh, not only for the pen test side, but also uh, as you know, in our world, AI. So uh, all of all of the, Machine learning language is built on Python. Do you see that question that Candace put up there? Oh, no, I didn't see it. It says, I've come across companies that offer both external and internal pen testing. How do you external teams offer internal pen testing to a different company? That's a good question. Okay. How do external teams offer internal pen testing to a different company? Uh, You don't. if the team that you do, I'm curious about that, Candice, as well, too, because how do external teams offer internal pen testing to a different? Yeah. So, I mean, when we talked to them, the way that they had described it was basically, you know, a, I think kind of what you were saying, where they, you know, you would expect the company to give certain information about like what your networks, you know, what your stack is and all that stuff. Um, so that they can come in and like do that test. And then the external side, they were saying as if it was, that was more for like the website and like external facing. So that's why I was- Oh, I see, I see what you mean. Okay, so no, thank you for the clarification on that. So yeah, that would probably be gray box right there, of course, right? But also when you say internal testing, the, the external, the supplier, to us, whatever X company gives us internal, that that internal componentry is literally either a, a pre-positioned table talk exercise, that's what I'm trying to understand, and or a, a staff log where they're kind of part of your organization. Is that what I'm trying to understand? Do um, I? No, uh-huh. it's just, it's it's a different company entirely that we had, you know, talked to about their pricing and what they offer and part of their offering was they said they would offer, you know, they could either do external pen testing for a certain cost, or they could do internal pen testing for you at a certain cost. So then based on how you've described it, that doesn't make sense to me at all. (laughs) Um, That, you know, if you're saying internal pen testing has to be a team within the company, 
who knows the company and who knows, you know, the ins and outs well, how does an external company come in and do an internal pen test for yeah, you? Yeah, that's that's a little bit. Uh, so it might. So you know, forgive me on that. It's a little bit misnomer because, to be quite honest with you, I've negotiated a lot of contracts, and those are typically run with like tabletop exercises or infrastructure audits. Uh, which kind of ties into the next one, which is going to be regulatory. So I don't know if that's something that they do, uh, that they offer. Uh, this slideshow is a little bit finicky with me today. I apologize, guys. Um, so it's a really good, really good point to bring across. But I really, I'm kind of curious what come. Maybe if, you know, if I would love to connect with you offline uh, to find out what. If you could share, I don't know if we have to sign an NDA for that, but if we could share that, because I'm really curious about that organization. Um, yeah, thank you, Kenneth. Yeah, oh, no, sure. no, I would love to connect with you after this if you have some time. Um, regulatory requirements, HIPAA, like we discussed, PCI, DIS, PCI DSS, which is payment structure, how you handle processes in payment, collection, transfer, uh, data, uh, Data stored, data at rest, data in transit kind of scenario, GPDR, general data protection regulations, that's really tied into uh, EU regulations, but uh, European standards regulations, but those regulations actually have a lot of influence on our, our CCPA, which is Consumer, uh, California Consumer Privacy Act, and also a CPRA, which is the Privacy Rights Act uh, as well too. SOC 2 is the gold standard, uh, as, as well as ISO, security operations, uh, compliance is what SOC stands for. SOC gives you a, uh, if an organization is very current on their SOC, means that every biannually, every quarter, whatever it may be, their cadence to have testing and also auditing done to make sure that they uh, follow regulatory compliance uh, for security, but also it's it's a mark of, it's a gold seal, really. Uh, if you have a company that's SOC to, uh, you feel a little bit of a level of confidence, right, uh, to do business with them. Uh, a lot of organizations, I, my last company, I, we would not touch any organization that does not do have a SOC or an ISO or a roadmap towards, uh, like trending towards having a SOC or a, uh, an ISO. If you violate any of these uh, types of uh, regulatory compliance, this, may, this is a very small subset. Right, thirty million four percent, forty-four percent. That's that's actually crazy high if you think about it. If you're a very large organization, but if you have a breach, you're you're spending hundreds uh, of millions, uh, and it will take a company under as well too. Uh, remediation costs at the end of the day, uh, if you have vulnerability discovered, fix it on the front end in the future when you do have a breach. And let's be frank, right? Let's be extremely transparent. With we're, what we're fighting is between the outside, the threat, the threat actors versus what we're doing inside for our organization. There's always going to be that battle. It's, a, it's an evolutionary battle, literally. It's not, will we be on the same playing field? We come close to it. But with the advent of a lot of technology nowadays, it's, it's an arms race, right? They're, they're going to stay two steps ahead in order to get your, your company's assets, basically, at the end of the day. So if you can have vulnerability discovered, remediated against beforehand, it, it gates or mitigates a lot of damage on the back end. Upkeep, right? A lot of companies, SolarWinds is a good example. Sorry if anybody works for SolarWinds. Um, 2020, when I was with New Relic, uh, Solar Winds had a breach uh, issue, and to be quite transparent, we dropped them. We we found a clause in the contract because it was reputational. It was a huge breach, and we got away from them as soon as possible. Now, at any organization I work at, I hear Solar Winds, I shudder. I really don't want to do business with Solar Winds, and that's the problem. If you lose your customer's confidence, you'll never get regained it back, regardless of what you do. So some quick steps through this. I know that I'm kind of going through this really rapid fire because we want to save some time for questions as well too, but scoping, uh, when you do an engagement with uh, a pen test company or pen testing as a service, uh, the, the initial landscape is scoping. 
uh, if you allow it, right? We signed, this is really going through the process of kind of going through uh, what's, what's on limits, what's off limits kind of scenario. And again, what we discuss white, black or gray box testing. Silver, uh, the cyber kill chain. So this is a methodology uh, of attack, basically. Uh, there is seven steps. So for a, for a hacker or a pen tester, um, you have your recon stage, which is reconnaissance. You're slipping into any of the systems and trying to cover your footprints, literally, um, to see what vulnerabilities that you can attack. You're not going to do it uh, in one fell swoop. Uh, some people stalk. Uh, some, you know, when I say stalk, hackers stalk some large companies for a, a few years or a few months before they plan an attack. So it's not uncommon to do recon for a number of time, a number of uh, 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 unlimited, uh, I wouldn't say unlimited, but a, a finite amount of time. Uh, weaponization, once you go to recon stage, you have a weapon of choice, really. You, you, I hate to say it like that, but you try to figure out what you're gonna do, right? What are you, are you doing a brute force attack? Are you doing a password? Are you, are you trying to hack into uh, doing a man in the middle? Are you trying to do a combination of a, a DOS and denial of service and then the back door slip into something else, right? So that's, that's a, uh, a method or a plan of attack, a POA for us in some instances. Next is delivery method. How are you going to deliver it? Are you going to use social engineering? Are you going to do uh, an email bomb or whatever it may be? Are you going to carry it out through a botnet attack? What are you going to do uh, for that? Next, once it's, it's, it's there for the delivery phase, you determine that, that what you're going to try to exploit. What are you, what's your target? Is it a financial motive? Is it a uh, what we call sometimes uh, a hacktivist, right? Is it a political cause? It, it exists, right? Uh, it does happen, uh, unfortunately, in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. There's a lot of hacktivists going on. Uh, really quick example is at the start of the, the war for that March 2022, uh, when the Russian uh, military was setting out their armory, tanks, munitions through Belarus to the eastern border of Ukraine, uh, Belarusian hacktivists uh, hacked into the logistics of the train routing and stopped the train for 17 hours to allow the Ukraine forces to advance. Um, so it does happen. Uh, it is not always motivated. I would probably say 95% of it is financial, uh, but the other 5% really is, ha is motivated by other uh, you know, political factors or whatever it may be. Environmentalists as well too use this. Hey, Johnny, we're 40 minutes, by the way, right now. Copy, so. copy that. Uh, I'll, I'm almost at the end of it, so I apologize. Installation, how are you going to install it uh, and deliver the payload, basically? Uh, once you deliver the payload, it's in the systems. Uh, it's you know, what we call a C2, command and control. You have the keys of the kingdoms at that point in time. You can navigate, and then you have to execute on your uh, your actions on objectives. What are you trying to do? And you have to do it in a finite, extremely finite amount of time. We've talked about this as well too: lateral movement, getting in the system, moving around. This is part of the reconnaissance phase. Artifact collection, instruction. Really, it's cleaning up the processes of footprinting. Uh, like when you go into the system itself, your recon stage, and really destroying any evidence of it, and also. So with the artifact collection and the reporting debriefing, this is on the pen test side, right? So um, as a service, you got to provide them with the debrief, the report of what you found, what the steps are for remediation. And of course, uh, as Ken has pointed out earlier, the costs associated with it as well. What's, what's high priority for you? Communication and reporting. Again, evidence of the vulnerabilities detected, uh, what course of action you should take, and the hierarchy of priorities. This is part of the, <laughs> I laugh because you always have to carry it. You, if you're part of the pen testing uh, service uh, or organization, there's a liability insurance associated with it. Minimum is three, five, three million per aggregate uh, for single occurrence, five per aggregate. But really you should be carrying at least 40, 40 mil, your organization. So last slide, most important slide. 
Uh, according to a need, indeed, pet decorators make 109 to 150 a year. I will tell you right now, honestly, we hired a pen tester recently. Her skill set, um, she makes 185 with a 15% bonus structure. She has our restricted stock units associated with it at 60,000. That's what the lower end. So there is a quite a bit of uh, financial gain to be a pen tester, especially now. Hey, Johnny, we got a question here. Um, what would be an example of evidence that could be left behind? Evidence that could be left behind. Um, in, in any environment, in any application, so physical, we can always say that there's, you know, there's going to be a physical element to that. But in digital componentry, it's a manipulation of logs. So log files, when you go into a system, any system, there's a detection system associated with it. IDS, EDRs, and the intrusion detection systems, endpoint detection system, you leave a signature. A signature is like literally a footprint. Uh, so a evidence of that would be a manipulation of that footprint log. Because everything you do in the system is always logged. That's why as security analysts, they have a log aggregation tool that combs over hundreds and thousands of logs a day and gives you a subset that you shouldn't review. So that type of evidence, if there's a manipulation, time entry, um, IP address associated with it, that's a, a, a example of the evidence that we would have to, well, the pen test team and, and the internal team would have to collect and review. Okay, and does that answer your question from the iPhone? Let's assume it does, uh, unless we hear otherwise. Um, Work-life balance. Work-life balance. Uh, I would say our, well, the organization I work at right now, the pen testers have, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be very transparent. Nobody in the pen test world, uh, unless you're higher on the echelon, uh, works, let's say, normal hours, right? You're, the job is remote majority like 90 percent of the time but pen testing happens at all hours of the day so you might have a uh, a midnight uh exercise you might have a 3 a.m exercise you're not going to do it during the day as much pen testing does happen during the day um but also to really test the stress test the system you're going to be doing it at night uh, off hours, not at night all the time, but really off cadence hours. So that way you can make sure that they have robust practices in place and they can spin up their their uh, their sock if that's part of the exercise as well too. Other questions before we, um, Isaac, how do we abbreviate this Kahoot? Can we abbreviate it? Because I want to get to Q and, you know what, let's do Q and A first before we do do the Kahoot and then people can stick around for the Kahoot. Um, I, I'd love to hear questions. Um, I, I will tell you that that Cyber Warrior, and again, if, if you're here um, just, to, just to, to, to learn a little bit, that's great. Um, if you are curious about um, cybersecurity uh, training, uh, we have a program that begins on Monday the 20th. Uh, we have an advanced and accelerated program uh, for people who have a little bit of an IT background who would like to get this, push this out in a 10-week program, but it's going to be a lot and you're going to need a background on that. We have that starting on March 13th, Clara, is that correct? Yep. Yep, guys, okay. And then another uh, program that begins on March 20th for the 28-week no IT background Um uh, no, no background needed. So we have a num number of different options. Again, what Johnny gave you is a, is a very preliminary glimpse of, of what, what's involved with our program. If we started to go into the weeds on, on real specific skills, it would lead we, to more can questions. Can we than please have an email with details, please? The details of the dates of the various start dates. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, an email with details of the various start dates and the timing in different time zones so that we can actually take a look. Sure. I can um, put it on the chat. Okay. Thanks, Thank Clara. You. Sorry about that. We, 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 sometimes for, for, for you both. can say verbally that we forget. Yes. 
for for both the advanced and the, and the regular please um yeah because my me i for one I, I don't have no experience so i would be much interested in the beginner one I and mean, i want to know more about it Thank yeah you. The, the 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 program um right now and again we have different methods that people can can use to pay the tuition we have isas we have we have non-traditional student loans i'm i'm hoping that uh for the for the march 20 start date we will have the ability to uh for people to use their their gi bill benefits either post 9 11 vrap vrne uh perhaps vet tech i'm not sure about that yet um the Traditional program, we are offering a special right now for the 28 week uh, boot camp of, of $16,000. For the accelerated program, which comes with one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and, and, and the, the, let, me, let me back up. The, the traditional program, we help you get a job. We will work with you on resumes, et cetera. We will introduce you to our networks to make sure you get a job. Um, the accelerated program comes with one-on-one -on -one job coaching. Um, that program is $23,500, but again, it comes with one-on-one -on -one intensive uh, job coaching uh, to, to, to get people to, 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 to climb that IT cybersecurity ladder as quickly as possible. Um, our ISA program is one that if you, uh, if you qualify, you get a risk-free, the tuition is paid for, and you start to pay it back once you get a job. So for example, um, if, if you start our program a week from next Monday on the 20th, um, the tuition will be paid for by an investor that is separate from Cyber Warrior Academy. Um, once you get a job, you are contractually obligated to have part of your income being shared uh, with the investor so that the investor recoups the tuition and, and, and there is a, for lack of a better word, interest, although because it's not a loan, um, interest is a, is a rough word to use. The, the beauty of that is that um, you don't start to pay that back until you're earning $50,000 a year or more. If you are, if you are not earning $50,000 a year, you do not start to pay back that investment made by, by, by the investor. Uh, until until you're earning that 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 level of income, um, they can only pull money from your paycheck every for 48 months. Once 48 months is over, um, then uh, then then you are you are no longer obligated. Um, most people will pay it back much quicker than that because the salaries in cybersecurity, um, the average start again average, and I, I want to manage expectations is around eighty thousand dollars. Um, if you're earning less than fifty thousand dollars in cybersecurity, it's not cybersecurity. It's it's it's, it's something else. Um, as you climb that that salary ladder, um, those payments are expedited because it's a percentage of your of your paycheck that's coming out on a on a paycheck by paycheck basis. So, um, and there's also an ascent student loan that that uh, is a non traditional loan that weights risk factor uh, as as part of the as part of the um, the terms that that they offer you. Again, these are all programs that are separate from Cyber Cyber Warrior. We want to make sure that we do what we do well, and that's train you. We want the financing piece to be done by people who do that well, uh, and and just for ethics purposes, we keep that that firewall very separate. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, what other questions do you guys have, Claire? I know put that number the the dates into the into the chat. Um, again, twenty eight weeks. Starting on February 20th, you'd be surprised how fast it goes. Uh, you will drink through a fire hose for 28 weeks. It is a lot. In that 10-week accelerated program, you will also drink through a fire hose for a very a much shorter period of time. Um, if you do not, if 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 you like the sound of 10 weeks, but you do not have an IT background for that 10 weeks, please don't kid yourself. Please don't do it. You will waste your time and your and your money. Um, it is it is. It will be hard. It will be impossible for you to do um, to to collect those skills. Um, be, and and the the start times are five thirty to nine thirty Monday through Friday. We will also have a program. Clara, when's the Pacific um, schedule uh, set up? We're going to have a program that's more geared towards people uh, going west from the East Coast. Uh, five thirty to nine thirty Pacific time yeah. is Monday. April three, April third. So you know, if you live in in the Central Time Zone, 
you'd be starting at 7.30 at night. If you if you live in, in Mountain, you'd be starting at 6.30 at night. And then obviously, if you live on the West Coast, you'd be starting at 5.30 at night. So um, we do try to offer different different schedules to meet to meet the needs of people. At some point, we may do a, a schedule that meets a couple of times a week, and but that would be uh, a program that lasts almost a year. Um, so there's no instant gratification there in terms of getting it done, getting it out, and 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 and, uh, and being on with your career. But right now, it's that that five days a week. Um, there and Bernard, right now there are no earlier times. We have thought about it. We have tried before, and the attendance for those earlier start times is very rough. Um, we've had to cancel a, a, a couple of classes because we just didn't have the, the, the students signing up. Um, what also has happened in the past is that people sign up for a, a program. Let's say, for argument's sake, it, it was noon to four East Coast time. Um, suddenly, people decide that they really need to work or, 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 or think life, life is getting in the way, and you see the attendance starting to drop. We're trying to set up time so that you guys can persist in the program, um, so that you are maximizing the investment of hours and money that you are you are making, so that you can succeed not only to get a job in cybersecurity, but to, but to do a, do a good job once you're in that that position. So right now there are no quote unquote daytime jobs. Naturally, if you're on the West Coast, you know Central Mountain, and you enroll in a 5:30 East Coast time zone. Um, then that that program would be beginning uh be beginning you know 4 30 3 30 2 30 depending upon where you live um but there's no quote unquote nine o'clock in the morning program at this point scheduled um what about if you live on the east coast and you want to do like a pacific time is that possible you, you want to be like a what a pacific time like you said they'll start at i guess 7 30 or it, yeah you can that, that class that i mentioned or the that i mentioned at, at um at uh that, that that starts on april 3rd um and at 5 30 pacific time that would be 8 30 eastern time and you are more than welcome to join that um if 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 you were a night owl um if that's what you're asking uh bernard yeah yes. yeah you're more than welcome to do that it, it 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 depends upon what fits with your schedule and what fits with your you know just life patterns you know i i know people who have taken that class on the east coast because they want to put their kids to bed at night they've got exactly. to get up yeah, here, that that's, kind of thing. yeah that's exactly my, that's my thing right there I, I, you know have um i have three kids or whatever so try to get them to bed around 8 39 so that'd be more suitable for me um what do i have to do i guess to get more information or to be in con um, get in contact with someone clara can you put your contact information in the chat do you have access to the chat, Bernard? Yes, yes I'm um, sharing. I, do. Oh, I, actually, I was asking because I actually, um, I'm on lunch break and I have to be back at once. So I just wanted to make sure I was able to get in contact with someone before I left. Yeah, so so uh, Clara G at cyberwarrior.com. Uh, and she will give you more information than you can possibly probably want to have. Um, and she's great. She's great at making sure you have all the information you need, both from a schedule perspective and, and from a um, figuring out the, the tuition payment process as well. Okay. Uh, questions in the chat. Um, self-paced courses are, yes, we do offer self-paced courses. Um, we have a, a an e-learning platform that people can go to uh, and you can, you can do self-paced. It is $49.95 a month. Um, it is automatically taken from from a credit card that you sign up for. Keep in mind that there is no job search assistance with that. Um, people who have done that in the past oftentimes say, "Yeah, this is great, but I'm gonna I'm gonna slide into uh, I'm gonna slide into the, the 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 boot camp because you know it takes discipline to go to the the self paced thing on a regular basis." Um, if you want to do certifications on the self-paced uh, process, you would con connect with us and we would then purchase on top of the, the $49.95 a month, we would purchase at our discount rate the uh, the vouchers for um, or the both the, the, the certification li uh, class licenses and then ultimately the voucher. I want to I want to remind people also um, that people in the boot camp get three certifications as part of the tuition there are no hidden fees or costs the two the, the certifications that we offer 
um, Cloud Plus, Pentest Plus, and Security Plus are well into the thousands of dollars if you were to go buy them off the street. And we offer them at a at a dramatically uh, reduced rate. Uh, and it is part of the it is part of the, the boot camp tuition. I will caution you that as important as certifications are, they are not the end all be all. They are we we believe that they help you get a job. We believe that they give you street credibility. Um, but a hiring manager wants to know that you know how to apply those skill sets uh, in a real world scenario as opposed to just knowing the academic. Okay. So um, do not do this just for the cert, do this for the cert, but also do it for the proprietary learning mo modules in vulnerability management and incident response uh, and malware analysis and packet analysis and, and, and some foundational networking skills and, and other things that will make you really good and proficient at what you do. Um, the certifications are great, but they um, there are a lot of people with certifications that don't know how to apply those certifications. They knew how to pass a, uh, an exam. Other questions? Alma has her hand raised for a long Alma, time. Alma, what do you got? Yes, my question is related to the um, presentation that John just did. So, and this is my question. So uh, in the presentation, John mentioned that there are three types of uh, pen testing tests, authorizations. And the, the first one is the white box, the black box and the gray box. Yes, ma'am. I, I can you explain the distinction between the black box testing and the gray box testing because I didn't catch the distinction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great question. Uh, so the question again was, uh, what's the differential between a bl black box testing and a gray box? So black box is your operating environment as a pen tester. You have no clue what the stack, their technology stack, their OS. Your operating system is so you're going in completely blind like if you were actually a threat actor like if you were really the bad guy right gray box gives you a scenario like typically gray box will say um these you can touch these don't don't ever touch these because these applications are super sensitive and you're not gonna to touch this. This is the operating environment that you can see. So they kind of pull a little bit of the curtain away to let you see, okay, this is, this is a Windows operating environment. Here's their, their tools they use for security. Here's the applications they use on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, don't touch Salesforce, their customer relationship management tool or their financial system of record or anything like the NetSuite, Coupa, and P2P session, because those contain a lot of uh, very sensitive information. Uh, so sensitive information means that if when you do a pen test, there's always a, a liability. That's why you have to the organization has to carry a large uh, liability insurance because there's always a case of a breach. So breaches happen, and when the breach happens, somebody has to pay for it. So it's the world we live in, right? It's just the way it is. Data is leaked, and if I'm a customer, like I was part of the T-Mobile breach back in when was it 2019, 2020. My information literally was leaked on the dark web. I had to comb through to find that and get it off as best as I could. So like, that's a, a small example of what it is. So anyways, to answer your question, I'm sorry to be long-winded. Black box, you don't know the operating environment. You, you, they go, have at it. Go, go, do, go do your worst. Gray box, this is what you can touch. This is what you cannot touch. So it's, it's literally setting some boundaries. I hope that answered your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. And um, my follow-up question. Um, would you recommend any specific tools for pen testing or their variety of them? There's a variety of them, but familiarity with Tenable, Nessus, Kali Linux is going to be your core. Um, we teach a lot of that in the CEH one. I think you're part of, you, you're in the curriculum right for C uh, right now. So yes. um, I don't know if you're in the module yet, you'll you'll enjoy it a lot. Um, it, the, the material is very long <laughs> on the, the, you know, the reference side, but those those tools will be probably your trademark Wireshark, Burp Suite. Those really are going to be your, your tools in your arsenal as much. We do use them, you know, in the other environment as well. They're like a real, real world environment. Thank you. Absolutely. Other questions? 
is this of interest to people that, you know, we also have the opportunity for people to go into breakout rooms if they want to go into a breakout room and, and talk about a, a, a unique circumstance. Um, people are more, more than happy to do that with you. Um, the, the two different options are, are truly unique options, again, for, for, for different skill sets. Um, but again, and, and both will get you a job. Um, but but one is 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 definitely for the person with, you know, Candace, based upon your background, the, the advanced probably would be for you. But there are some people with advanced uh, with a, with an advanced knowledge set that want to do the longer program because they like the review and the review sets them up for success with the with the, with the cyber skills down the road. Um, but that's that's entirely up to you. But both both are are tremendous options. Both are a lot of work, but you you feel a, a great reward at the end of them. Anything else? If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to be part of this presentation today. And also, like I would love to see you guys, any of you in my uh, in my future classes. Uh, uh, again, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. John is the instructor for the class that starts uh, in a week and a half. So um, if, if you like his delivery, then um, then, then he's your guy. Um, keep in mind also that once you are with Cyber Warrior, you are always with Cyber Warrior. You can repeat this class uh, again and again and again. Uh, if you feel like you missed pieces of, of, of the cohort that you were in uh, because you got busy or you didn't understand something, you can go back and listen to the classes. We, re we record every class. So you can go back and listen, but we also allow you the opportunity to come back and, and take the part or all of, of a future cohort again, because we want you to succeed uh, in, in, in this program. And, and that's, again, part of your original tuition. There's no additional charge for, for doing it. Okay, and so I think we're going to call this a night. Um, again, you, Clara put her information in the into the chat. Uh, please, please, please be in touch, uh, and we will be certainly... Uh, uh, looking forward to being in touch with you. Thanks every, very much, everybody, and have a great day.